Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. We have over a thousand attendees at this webinar, so uh, no pressure, we're on. Um, and it's gonna be great. Gaming has become an important concept in learning and a hot topic within that field is escape rooms. In simulation-based training, escape rooms are being used uh, to place learners in an environment where they have to solve hidden puzzles along with their peers while, quote, locked in the same room. For healthcare professionals and for students, escape rooms have been shown to increase learner engagement, improve teamwork and communications, and reinforce clinical, clinical tasks and clinical skills. We have with us three expert panelists today, and I'm going to introduce each and ask them just to give a brief comment on what they're doing that's, that's unusual and compelling in their uh, simulation escape room program. So first we have with us Janine Valco. She is from the Simulation Education uh, uh, Center at uh, the Star Center at Allegheny Health Network. I'm sorry, Janine, I, I just misspoke a little bit. So you are the Simulation Education Manager. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's uh, compelling and unusual about what you're doing there at the Star Center? So we're actually using our escape rooms to uh, facilitate a mock code escape room. And we're also doing room of errors escape rooms. And additionally, we're building a men escape room and a falls escape room. So we're taking them on the road, we're doing a mobile and we're doing them um, in our own simulation center as well. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So next I'd like to introduce Jim Beam. He is the clinical simulation coordinator at the University of Connecticut Health Center, go Huskies. Uh, Jim, why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at, at, with your simulation escape room program? Sure, um, so we also have a um, room of risk, uh, our safety um, escape room. We have a pediatric one. Uh, we have um, two different OB ones, one that's a little bit more high tech, one that's a little bit more simple. Uh, and the last one, we've uh, involved our patient instructors um, with an escape room so they can kind of see the new modality that we're using for our students as well. Very nice. Thank you. You're doing great work out there in Farmington. And last, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Wallenberg. Brian is the simulation specialist at the Perry Center for Clinical mm -hmm. Skills and Simulation at the University of South Dakota, Sanford School of Medicine. Brian, why don't you tell us uh, what you're doing that's unique over in your uh, part of the world? A, a couple things. Uh, we've done a sepsis uh, type activity um, with, a, with a somewhat typical sepsis patient, uh, but working through sepsis, uh, giving different clues and hints and puzzles to, to solve that sepsis problem. And then we've also used it uh, in a way for med students to um, learn and understand comprehensive metabolic panels, um, how to associate different lab values with different findings and uh, different presentations of patients. Great, thank you. So, um, so let's begin. Our, our first question has to do with, with getting started. The simulation escape rooms are an immersive experience and can take a lot of time and, and effort to plan. So could each of you provide one tip for getting started with simulation escape rooms? And Janine, we'll start with you, please. Sure. Um, my tip for beginning to plan an escape room would be just really thinking that it's an, a course, just like you would plan any other course. Make sure you understand and define your course objectives and your outcomes. And keep in mind that, you know, with a simulation escape room, you want to have six to eight participants. So therefore, you might have to run several different sessions but clearly define that, understand who your learners are, and make sure that you, your initial plan involves all of those things. Very well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, why don't we turn to you? So Janine made a good point about um, just the number of people. What, what advice would, would you be given, uh, given yeah. for this? I would say um, keep it easier than what, what you believe the difficulty level needs to be. Um, it seems like a grand plan when you initiate it and all the work that needs to go into it. Um, but once you get started, you realize there are plenty of resources out there. And uh, again, like that, that first puzzle needs to be really simple. 
just to get them going, um, kind of throwing them, not to throw them their first answer, but just we have a good idea of everything that's going to take place or in our minds, what we think is going to take place. Uh, but we have all the information where the, the learner comes in with little to no information. So, uh, so start off simple. Start off simple. Very good. Uh, Jim, how about there at uh, UConn? Sure. Um, I would say you want to make sure you have a content expert when you're designing it, um, someone to help uh, with creating the goals. Um, so, you know, your OB is going to be very, very different from your pediatrics. Um, so bring in that, that content expert to help you with the design, the goal, um, and even they can help you with some of the clues uh, to create those. Very good. Um, so just to summarize, so we've got focusing on a number of people and, and resources, uh, keeping it simple, and then making sure you have a content expert uh, uh, chiming in and, and giving you some guidance as you go along. So we're going to move to our first uh, poll question. And you're going to see that appear on your screen in just a moment. So for the audience, have you ever created your own simulation escape room? So it looks like about 90% have not ever created their own escape rooms. Only about 10% have. Very good. So um, basically, every, but most of the people online are 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 beginners, okay? So we'll keep that in mind as, as we go through the, uh, the remaining questions. So escape rooms involve solving puzzles. And I imagine that planning puzzles can be, can be difficult um, to make sure that you create a puzzle that's truly engaging for, for your learners. What's one suggestion each of you would like to give to new simulation escape room designers on, on how to create these these puzzles. And on this one, Jim, we're going to begin with you, please. Sure. Um, I think it gets back to the, you know, keep it simple. Um, you want to, don't worry about doing any high tech stuff. Um, the highest tech stuff we do is a black light. Uh, the black light is really nice because um, it just, it gives the, the students something to kind of look throughout the room for. Uh, but, you know, simple puzzles, uh, paper puzzles that are cut out into shapes, um, keep it simple. Okay. Very good. Um, Brian, why don't, we, uh, why don't we go to you? Uh, I would you say have? don't rush out and purchase locks um, <clears throat> and all that kind of stuff. Um, use the things that you have readily available. Um, use QR code generators. So you could leave QR codes laying around that could also give clues. Um, pill identification, um, mirrored images. Um, there's, there's so many things. Uh, iPad passwords, uh, things like that, computer passwords that you can use without having to uh, put a lot of uh, financial burden on your center uh, to get started. Very good. And Janine, what, what advice would you have on uh, building puzzles that are engaging? So some of the things that I would also recommend is exactly what both Jim and Brian said, but um, we did things like just laminating a piece of paper, cutting it out and making that be a puzzle. Um, we use syringes where we actually glued them to certain numbers. Using your imagination and your creativity, I think your team can come up with a lot of really interesting puzzles um, you know, to really engage the learners. But I think the biggest thing is, is that you really need to beta test it. So watch out for those risky, you know, um, puzzles that are a little bit more difficult. You know, understand your time limit of how long you want to actually present your escape room and make sure you beta test the actual escape room with your team to check the level of difficulty and, you know, PDCA, plan, do, check, act, follow that cycle and refine it. And then, you know, and then um, try it again. Very good. So a recurring theme, and, and this is good for the, especially for the 90% in our audience who are just getting started, simplicity continues to be a theme and um, bravo uh, on, on that notion of beta testing and, and taking everything for a trial run first. So now we're going to move to uh, our next poll question. Um, so for those who have run their own simulation escape room, what type of simulation did you rely on? And you're gonna see some choices appear on your screen. Low fidelity simulation, high fidelity simulation, 
in situ simulation, um, one of my personal favorites, and uh, or uh, the, the fourth option, which is just more than one type of simulation. Okay, it looks like uh, overwhelmingly the uh, number one response of 54% was low fidelity simulation. Uh, number two, 31% was more than one type of simulation. Number three to 11% was high fidelity sim and 5% was in site to sim. Well, very good. The, uh, we're, we're going to sort of go in reverse here in terms of, in terms of uh, our, uh, our question because our next question actually homes in on, on high fidelity, but we're going to get to the low fidelity in just a moment. So we've just seen uh, escape rooms can, can cover a broad range of fidelity. Uh, if you're using high fidelity and you're using a high fidelity um, mannequin, in your escape room. What are some creative ways you've put a high fidelity simulator to work in an escape room? And uh, we're gonna pitch this one over to you first, Jim. Sure, um, actually one of our fun ones is our OB room. Um, we have throughout the, the time that they're doing it, they're grabbing all different things, but we actually have our high fidelity birthing simulator in there. And it ends when they gather everything and the, birth, the baby gets birthed. Um, and then the key to unlock the box to get out of the room is actually attached to the umbilical cord. Oh, nice, nice. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Janine? Um, so our one, our, my favorite one with our high fidelity um, simulator is the mock code escape room. And all the resources are locked in a box and sequentially, as you manage the arrest of the patient, each one of those resources is open. So according to your policy and procedures, American Heart Association guidelines, um, you would open each step. So that actually translates to any policy, any procedure or any protocol that we would use in healthcare. So I think, you know, the linear approach to that model is, is so much fun for our learners because they have to still, you know, manage the arrest and they're still doing compressions. They're still ventilating our patient while the other team members are in the room managing, you know, to open the puzzles. And those serve as actual, the same things that you would actually experience, the challenges that you would experience in a mock code. Maybe, you know, having to create, having to, you know, get an epi drip from the crash part or get a certain medication set up suction. So that's what, you know, we found out in the debriefing. Okay, so I'm seeing a recurring theme and I want to see where Brian falls in on this. Brian? Yeah, so Leap software allows uh, really uh, a free form of programming uh, our mannequins. Um, so we can use, uh, if you have medication recognition and they give um, the correct antibiotic for sepsis, uh, we have the mannequin actually speak a code or um, we've downloaded the, or uploaded the uh, voice file to the mannequin and actually gives either information to, to move or progress the uh, activity along or to actually give a code. All right, so, so you did fall in line with the recurring theme because the recurring theme is, is that everything is fun. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's engaging because it's offering a challenge. It's creating a little bit of either personal or team competition. And um, it, to, to one degree or another, each of, each of the examples you gave, um, has an element of fun to it. It's, it's got the clinical challenge, but it's, um, it's mixing it up in, in, in a unique way that's, that's a lot more engaging. So outstanding. We're going to move now to the, um, the lower fidelity end of, of things. So um, share an escape room scenario um, where it is more beneficial to use a low fidelity simulation. And um, Brian, we'll, we'll start with you, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think it goes back to um, those objectives and the way you plan any sort of activity. Um, it can be a low fidelity, like a, a successful IV start, um, and, and they progress uh, beyond that. Um, so uh, like all education, we need objectives and looking for outcomes and uh, create activities during your escape room um, that fit those objectives. And so, all right, very good. Or even crossword puzzles, simple. Excellent. That's that's a brilliant idea. Uh, Janine, how about how about you at the Star Center? 
So at the Star Center, we've created a, um, a room of errors escape room, and that one is really uh, unique because we use our low fidelity mannequin and we'll set them up with, you know, maybe the, pa the, um, the patient is lying flat with an NG tube feeding, and every error that is recognized, each one of the participants gets a puzzle piece. They put the puzzle pieces together, and then we take the, the letters from the puzzle piece and those ones match a cryptogram of like a letter equals a number, if you will. And then that's the number that they choose to, you know, that they will use to escape the room. So that one is so much fun. And then the value is really debriefing afterwards and going through each one of those errors and how it um, affects the patient's outcomes. All right. Very, very good. Um, Jim, over at UConn. Yeah, actually, um, it, we do a very similar, uh, we do our uh, room of errors, uh, very similar. Uh, but one of the fun ones is don't forget about your uh, low fidelity task trainers. One of the things that we do for our pediatrics is we actually take and um, in four font, uh, we'll actually write the clue for one of the locks um, and we place it inside the ear of one of our otoscopy trainers. Um, so once they find the otoscope that says, where would I most likely use this, um, they'll go over and uh, hopefully uh, correctly use the otoscope, and, uh, and that's where they'll find the clue. So that's, uh, don't forget your task trainers. So um, what I'm going to conclude here, and I'll just kind of, I'll look for, for head nods. Uh, I would imagine that you're using the low fidelity for um, more... Uh, critical thinking skills and introductory skills also, uh, and then you're saving the high fidelity simulation for for more advanced for advanced advanced practice. I'm not hearing mm -hmm. a resounding no, Andrew. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, mm -hmm. so we'll so we'll move on to the next question, which uh, has to do with videotaping. So so if you're a student and you're going into this environment, which if you've never done an escape room on the outside, is has got to be a bit of a new experience. Now you're also being videotaped and you know that you're essentially on stage, uh, certainly um, in front of the faculty um, that's teaching them, but presumably before their peers as well. What do you do to introduce them to this methodology and introduce them to the idea that now I'm on stage while I'm going through this process in a way that, how do you introduce it to them in a way that puts them at ease? And uh, Janine, why don't we start with you on that? So um, the pre-briefing is really the most important part, Andrew. Um, I really feel like, you know, you, you first need to understand your audience, ask them if they've actually participated in an escape room and let them bring to you what they've seen and felt in an escape room. Um, help them to understand that the door really isn't locked because some of them get a little nervous about that. Um, also too, you wanna make sure that they, they know that you, know, you are the facilitator and you can actually ask questions or provide clues if that's the rules. So you wanna make sure that they understand the rules of the game, how long it will take. And not only that, if it is a linear progression, meaning one, um, one puzzle, will help lead you to the next one, or if it's multifaceted, say if there's several different things happening at one time, they need to understand those rules. So they need to know the clear connection of what's going on. Some of our escape rooms will actually like take a minute off if they ask you for a clue, and we'll give them three clues and you know really define the rules of the game. Nice, nice. How about uh, you, Brian, uh, out there in uh, South Dakota? Give me that question one more time. So uh, when, you're, uh, when you've got students who've never been in an escape room environment, they're being videotaped, they know that they're on stage before their faculty and, uh, and, and possibly their peers, what do you do to put them at ease? Um, escape rooms in general would never be the first thing that they do when they come to our center. Um, the very first thing we do have them do uh, initially when they're first years is uh, have them read and sign an AB agreement uh, that we have with all of our students, or all of our users, learners, and uh, they are they become very familiar that we don't share their videos with anyone other than other than that uh, the group that they're with. Um, so I, I've seen a number of questions come on the chat side. Do you have videos or YouTube videos? Um, we don't subject our students to putting that stuff out there. 
Um, it's just the, the, anything can happen once the video gets out. So, and, and to record an escape room where they um, really kind of know the answers already, it would not work very well. It wouldn't be a good representation. So sure. our students are very comfortable with the fact that any video recorded is a secure video that only they will see. Very and good, of course. Very good. Uh, Jim, how about there at UConn? Uh, we follow kind of along the same guidelines that, that Brian uh, has, that those are just internal videos. Um, but one of the things that we do to try to uh, keep the students at ease, especially since our is actually a, a locked vault room, um, we always have a staff member that's in there, and that's actually the person who will provide those, uh, those uh, clues. Um, but also, if, if you've got a group that's really just struggling, um, you can you can throw out just uh, a, a guide. Um, you might want to look in the cabinets or something along those lines. It doesn't necessarily affect it, but just kind of helps them along a little bit. So, uh, bottom line, you're you're introducing people slowly. You're letting them know it's a safe environment, and you're not throwing them in the deep end of the pool either. You're you're allow, you're you're coaching them along um, as as they get introduced to this process. That's that. That's all excellent. We're going to move to our uh, third polling question, which you're going to see appear on the screen in just a moment. So for our audience, for those who have run their own simulation escape room, in what areas did you see the most significant improvement? Increased confidence, improved retention, improved return on investment, or something else? So uh, since obviously most of our audience are new to some escape rooms. We've had a little bit less of the voting, but 63% said uh, overwhelmingly it would be uh, to increase confidence. And second, 20% of his other um, improved retention at 12% and then improved ROI was 5%. All right, very good. So this next question falls right in line with, with what we're seeing, increased confidence. Um, uh, it really ties into to all the points in, in our polling question. Please share with us your most astonishing result that you've seen from introducing, once you've started introducing escape rooms into, um, into your training program. So most astonishing result. And uh, Jim, we're going to start with you, please, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, probably the buy-in and motivation are probably the two biggest things I see. Uh, they, they enjoy simulation as a whole, but you always get a little bit of reticence when it's the mannequin based and they're in those small three to four groups. Um, and sometimes it kind of feels like a one-on-one, -on -one, whereas in this, they're, they really buy in because they're in the larger group, they can work together, um, and it kind of hits to each person's strengths that are in there. Some are better with puzzles, some are better, you know. So uh, just for us, the buy-in and the motivation has been really strong. All right. Brian, how did the University of South Dakota? Yeah, I would say um, improve social skills and inclusion for all the learners. Um, kind of like Jim said, not everyone is great at everything, but many are good at some things. Um, and when we can get those together, um, you know, they, they go in, you know, not knowing what everybody is good at and they come out seeing that everyone has a skill uh, one way or another. Um, so it's, it, it helps get people communicating right away. Nice, nice. Janine, I'm sorry, Janine. Mm -hmm. So I think the most astonishing result along with what both Jim and Brian said was we actually collected data on their knowledge, their actual performance, and we also tested, we also um, collected data on the attitude of the actual escape room. And overwhelmingly, it was amazing to see the knowledge um, just with the, the experience that they went through. We gave them a standard pretest ahead of time, and then we gave them, we actually did a mock code, and then we, we repeated it after the escape room experience, and then we gave them the same test. And there was an, an overwhelmingly increase in their knowledge in the standard test that we had. So that was really what astonished us the most. Excellent. Well, 90% of our audience, I'm sure, is right now putting, looking on their calendars for where, when they can do their first, uh, first escape room. Um, so here's one more question, and then we're going to get to audience questions. Um, research shows that, uh, that escape rooms uh, 
and, and this is why gaming has become so important. Research shows that escape rooms can burst, boost uh, learning comprehension and retention. Um, what do you think sets escape rooms apart from other game-based uh, learning approaches? And Janine, we'll start with you, please. So I kind of come up with a phrase of a connected learning experience. Um, I, you know, a lot of our learners are visual learners and they're actually able to associate the actual puzzles and the events that happen in the escape room with the actual, with the policy or procedure or skill that you're, you're trying to um, meet your objective with. So um, to me, that's the biggest one. I like to call it a connected learning experience. Nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, uh, what do you think sets escape rooms apart? Well, if you can do this early enough in the learner's uh, education, uh, where there's no preconceived um, individuals that are maybe better at simulation, maybe better at puzzles and all that kind of stuff, um, get them in early uh, before there's before there's kind of leaders uh, that are identified. Um, because leaders will always want to lead, but they may not be the best leader in this type of activity where maybe somebody that would initially stand in the corner uh, feels really comfortable in this area and finds it challenging and rewarding and really steps to the front. So um, that, that's something we found that, that, is, that worked well and, and, and that the more leaders we can promote in healthcare, the better off we are. Uh, absolutely, and this goes back to your point about social socialization and so forth too and um and and uh, leadership and followership skills are are all um being taught in um in many schools today through qsen and and so forth so that's brilliant uh jim why don't we turn to you how how do escape rooms set themselves apart from other forms of game-based learning um, we haven't done a ton of game-based learning, um, but some of the game-based learning that we have is very, it's almost uh, challenging. It's, you know, who can get the best time on this uh, simulator or things along those lines. Uh, whereas this, it definitely creates that more team-based learning. Um, you're uh, kind of along what Brian said, you're, you're really taking um, uh, the folks who are going to be um, great leaders and, and combining, you just combining all the different personalities and, and watching them work together um, in a much more fun versus stressful environment. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's where it, it definitely strengthens that team-based learning. Excellent, thank you. So now we're going to turn it over to the, uh, to the audience questions. Um, so we're just gonna uh, pause for a moment uh, while some of those questions get uh, are read. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll assign who uh, who should have first crack at those questions. So the first question is, can you describe one clue process just for reference? What would one puzzle piece look like? So Jim, you're on. What would one puzzle piece look like? Um, so we actually, it, literally, we um, print out one of the, for our um, Room of Errors one. Uh, we actually expand with uh, a Caudi card, the, um, uh, when to use a uh, catheter and when not to use. Um, so that's what the front of it looks like. And then we literally, we laminate it and cut it up into different shapes. So it only fits together one certain way. Um, and that's actually where our black light also comes in because once they get that puzzle together, if they flip it over and shine the black light on it, um, and it actually says, I hope this shines a light on safety for you, something along those lines. Um, their next clue is actually pieced together on the other side. So literally just a piece of paper, laminate it, cut it out. That's simple. Very good. Janine, are you doing anything different with that? Uh, what would you say to that one puzzle piece? So one, one of my, the, I think the puzzle pieces is the most fun. Um, when our learners come in the room, we actually just printed a banner, put it up above the door. So they are, you know, faced with coming in, looking at the different, you know, in the escape room and they're trying to find the first clue. And, you know, a lot of times one of the, one of the participants will turn around and go, oh, look, there it is. You know, like the first one is, is um, 
Um, so whenever you activate a code blue, um, the number is 412 is what we have on there. So first thing you always want to do, of course, is get your phone to call um, the number if you're, you know, in-house. But um, our first clue is that when the phone's locked in a box and the banner is up, a, up on the door. So that's a real easy one that you can actually do that is so much fun. Because when they finally figure it out, because they're, they come in oblivious to what's above the door. All right. And Brian, what would you say to that first puzzle piece question? Uh, something just like using a, uh, a number of syringes that spell a certain word or, um, or not the syringe won't spell the word, but have a letter on a color coded syringe and then uh, maybe like a base plate where all the syringes need to fall into place and that would give them, them a, a code or uh, something to get into uh, an iPad or, 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 a, or a computer and then that would give them more information again. So okay. Of Very good. Uh, our next question. How many clues would be appropriate and how long should the session take? Okay, Brian, since you were up last, how many? Uh... Yeah, some of our puzzles have taken up upwards to an hour. Um, if the group is smaller for work, our, our PA class is a class of 25, so we can get them maybe all going simultaneously and then uh, maybe go for up to an hour. And then uh, as for clues, we typically, if we know it's going to run near an hour, our clues would be a max of three, Q, three clues, uh, every, one clue every 15 minutes. Um, just, we just don't want them to continue asking for clues. So we put a time limit on how frequently they can get a, a clue. Sure. Janine, do you take a different approach? Um, a, a little bit of a different approach. So we, w once we beta test it, then we can really understand how long each puzzle takes. Um, on average, um, we try to like go f every five minutes just so that we can keep the policy, the procedure or what we're doing um, moving so that the flow, because flow is really important for our escape rooms. So really testing that level of difficulty for each one of the puzzles and each one of the clues that you give is really key so that it keeps it in that time frame. Our initial um, beta test of our mock code escape room, if you will, took almost 45 minutes for, and our team actually did it first, but we wanted to keep them around 30 minutes because um, our actual course time was gonna be an hour with our nurse residents that we started with. So sure. just beta testing, that's, that's a real important factor whenever you're building this. Very good. Uh, Jim, how, how long and how many clues? Uh, yeah, we actually, um, the beta testing is absolutely the, the way you want to figure out how long, uh, but we try to keep ours to about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, this way we have uh, plenty of time for debriefing following, because we usually try to set aside an hour per group. So between the, the escape room and then the, the debrief, um, you know, the escape room time is about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and the number of uh, puzzle pieces, it's usually we probably try to keep it to, um, six, uh, ballpark around six, including some locked, some unlocked uh, things along those lines, uh, just to keep, and again, the, the flow is really important, just making sure that you know that one thing leads to another leads to another, um, so you don't kind of, there are, if you don't do it right, sometimes you can get a clue that came out that has nothing to do with anything, and, and then it creates a little more uh, difficulty. Okay. Very I think, good. Can, I, can I chime in here just a second? Um, sure. What Jim's getting at is linear versus multi-linear um, escape rooms. So um, sometimes one is easier than the, than the other, but yeah, multi-linear with large number, larger numbers is, uh, seems to be easier for the participants because they can all kind of be working, two or three people working in different areas, all attempting to solve one common goal. Excellent input. Thank you. Why don't we move to our uh, next question, please? I started running Janine's Save Harry escape room this semester. Thank you so much for sharing at the Sun Conference. My biggest concern is that students can't get out of their own mind in order to treat it like an, es an escape room and not a normal simulation they're used to experiencing. How do you address this in your facilities? Any pre-brief terms that may help? 
So, so thank you. Just yeah, I'm going to give that to you, Janine, and I was going to say if I needed to, su to summarize that, but uh, um, why don't you go ahead, and if I need to summarize it uh, when we turn to Jim and Brian, uh, I will. Great. So I think, you know, really important to make sure whenever you pre-brief that you help them understand that they're actually going to be managing a mock code. They're going to be actually involved in an arrest situation and they still have to make sure that they're caring for our patient while um, working with the different, um, opening the different boxes and going through the different tasks. So pre-briefing, um, which is exactly where you pointed out, um, we make sure that they understand in the, in the, in the get-go that you know, all the resources that they have are inside the box that they're going to need. And, and during the actual um, escape room, you will need to perform CPR just like you normally would for um, a regular experience. So um, I think that that whole setting the stage is what's most important whenever you facilitate. Help them understand that everything, all their resources are there and everything that you normally would do is there to manage your arrest. Very good. So I'm going to go, um, Brian, then Jim. Um, did you did you follow that question and the idea of how do you get students to get out of their normal simulation mindset and get into an escape room um, mindset while still managing their clinical tasks along the way? How, how do you approach that in your I, facility? I agree with what Janine said. Uh, setting the ground rules is important for any simulation, uh, probably even more important for this type of um, what, what we would call gaming. Um, so sure. uh, use the term gaming um, and uh, people tend to if we want to, it's obviously serious learning still happening, but let them know this is a game and this isn't this isn't normal simulation. This isn't what you came here for maybe last week. Um, rarely uh, is these types of activities or probably never would be summative. So formative education, let them know that that there's pressure to solve the puzzles and to escape the room, but there's also time that you just would communicate with each other in the room, your other team members, in a different way that you would communicate if the actual patient was there. Sure. Jim? Sure. Um, to give an example that, that the students have actually used, um, honestly, the, the locked box uh, for me is the thing that I've seen is able to switch most students out of the typical simulation mode and into the escape room mode. And I've even had folks, at, when they find that first lockbox, I've had students say, wait a minute, this is like a real escape room. <laughs> and, and I think that's, for me, that's the trigger, uh, that lockbox is you're not gonna find that in any other type of simulation. Okay, thank you. So why don't we go to our next question? Do you have any suggestions for implementing a multidiscipline, for example, nursing, EMS, fire science students, escape room simulation? So Brian, why don't we begin with you on that one uh, since you do flight paramedic work and so forth? Yeah, as long, um, that's, that becomes more difficult obviously because you have a variety of levels of learner. Um, but depending on your objectives, again, if, you're, if, if it's about communication, then make your puzzles about communication. Um, it, should, it should fit all levels of learner or all disciplines uh, in order to get them all engaging, but that definitely creates a, an added challenge by having multidisciplinary uh, games. Sure, sure. Uh, Jim, when are we talking um, about? We actually have not gotten into multidisciplinary yet because as Brian stated, it creates a lot more complexity um, that you're, you're looking at it as opposed to, you know, this is an OB challenge or this is a pediatrics challenge. Um, so we have not gotten to that yet, um, but I agree, it's all gonna be setting up those, those puzzle pieces um, to make sure that you're, you're fostering that communication. All right, Janine? And so, for us, we've actually taken our mock code escape room on the road and one of our sites actually did the mock code escape room and they invited all the participants that would normally participate in an arrest and they had pharmacists there and nursing assistants. So, and it was competitive. 
Um, so it actually worked in that environment. So I would just go back um, to what we talked about at the beginning, understanding your course objectives, who your learners are, and creating an escape room that would also um, motivate all the learners to learn, but keep in mind what their educational level is. But what's really unique about the escape room activity itself is it taps into all of the skills of each one of those participants. And, you know, you may need the pharmacist to actually, you know, create a drip rate or what have you as you normally would in a, in a, in a, um, in a code situation. So um, build your escape room to what the knowledge level of each one of your participants is, and you can include all of them. Outstanding. Thank you. And next we'll, we'll hear another question. If you are building the escape room as a team, how do you define who does what in the creation of the experience? Janine, why don't you go ahead and begin with that? So I, um, I, I, our initial team was a very small group. So we started out with three or four members of our team, um, really started to focus on a concept and really come up with an idea um, that we would work on. Um, and then we started to brainstorm. Um, once we started to brainstorm, it did take um, several of us and to actually use our imagination to move from one step to the next. Um, and then we just tapped into each other's skills. I think the biggest thing is, is um, you do need like several different minds working together um, so that you can come up with the most imaginative, um, you know, tasks and puzzles, if you will. So um, we didn't really assign people specific roles. We actually just worked as a team and that seemed to really help us, you know, um, build and create our escape room together. So I think it's all, all the minds working together. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jim, why don't you weigh in, please? Uh, sure. Um, along the lines of, uh, the lines of what Janine said, um, we usually start with a, a small group, but we always make sure there's a content expert in there. Um, mm -hmm. Because what we found is the larger the group, you get tons of ideas thrown out, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but trying to create, take all of those different ideas and create a flow that works. Um, that's kind of where we go with the, um, just a small group coming up with how they want that flow to be and what the goals are. And then once we get the goals, then we start to look at, okay, what, what are some tasks that you would like them to do that would achieve that goal? And then we try to weave that into the flow and, and, and make it a, um, a, a hopefully seamless activity. Sure, sure. Brian? Um, my team has been myself and a content expert. Um, I've, our team is pretty small in our center. Uh, there's five of us that are full-time and, uh, and everyone's busy. And I like this type of education. So I've kind of taken it upon myself and then found others to help me make sure that all the information is, is accurate and up to speed with, with what the faculty member is uh, basically trying to meet with their objectives. Sure. So you, so you make do when you're with, you make do with when you're without, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I think a lot of people in simulation uh, do that. So uh, why don't we go to our next question, please? Can you expand on other avenues instead of locks? Like how do you use the QR generator to unlock something or how do you use mirrored images? So, Jim, did you you said you were using QR codes, correct? Or was that Brian? Brian was the QR code. Yeah, I brought that up. I'm sorry. So why don't we begin with you, Brian? Yeah, so uh, you can just have a QR code. Um, maybe if uh, you can have it basically anywhere. If they see a QR code, um, they should realize that there's something to read the QR code. So if you allow them to go in with their phone or have something in the room like an iPad, or, or a touchpad of some sort um, that they can actually scan that QR code. And then uh, if you're familiar with the QR code generator, you would have that QR code go to an actual code or it would go to, you could use it to, we've done to a question uh, that they would readily know the answer to. And then you could use that answer to progress to the next puzzle. So Jim, are you using QR codes at, at your location? We're not using QR codes, um, but one of the things that we do without a lockbox, and I, I think we talked about the um, uh, room of errors, um, is 
when they, let's say they need to put up the side rails. Uh, when they pop up one of the side rails, there's a puzzle piece that you know, hangs down below that can't be seen until then. Um, if the catheter, if the, the urine bag is on the bed, when they move that, when they move that to the appropriate location, they'll find a puzzle piece there. Um, so as they fix each of those safety issues, um, they're unearthing more and more puzzle pieces. All right, Janine, what are um, you doing there? So we haven't used the mirror image, but I've actually seen in some of the research that we've done that they've actually taken words and written them backwards or numbers and written them backwards in certain areas of the room where you'd have to stand up with a mirror and hold it to, and look in the mirror for the actual code to get you to the next box. So that's where, where the mirrored image, I think, comes into play. Okay. Great. I think we still have time for a few more questions and then what we'll do is uh, allow our moderators to guide us uh, as, as we uh, home in on the hour. But I, I think we've, we've got time for a few more. So there are a couple questions about keeping it fresh. Do you change it every time so people don't share solutions with new learners? How do you keep it fresh for new groups coming in? Janine, how do you keep it fresh there? So um, one of the things that we can do is actually we can change the numbers on the locks and we can change the, the different patterns um, of the different codes. Um, if there is a competition, we make sure we tell the learners in the pre-brief and the debrief that you're not gonna wanna share the information. So when one of our sites, actually Jefferson Hospital did mock code um, escape room and they had different units competing against each other and nice. they told the learners don't share. So um, when we actually do it again, we can change up those the locks and use a different code. So that's important. Jim, how are you keeping it fresh there? Um, kind of along the same lines. We uh, most of the time we have the same. Um, we have you know a group of a hundred some odd students, um, and we have to put them in small batches. Uh, I mean, the fact that they know that they're being timed, and um, you know any winner, uh, anybody, whichever group has the best time goes up on the social media page or things like that. Um, so they, uh, we found that they tend to keep it to themselves. Um, when we move into uh, different groups, let's say we go from OB to, um, you know, to the med group, um, then we'll do the same. We'll, uh, we'll make it more specific to that group. But yeah, we can change the, the lock code changes are super easy. Um, the, they're very inexpensive and super easy to change the code. So that helps. All right. And Brian? Uh, similar. Honor code, um, our learning management system, uh, when they sign in uh, to the room, they have to accept an honor code. And uh, students do know that if they, uh, th they get to meet typically with a dean or an assistant dean if they share information anytime they're in our center. Um, so we, we hold the honor code pretty high. Um, students know not to talk to each other. <laughs> All right, very well. Um, so I think we have time for uh, one more question, and then we've got uh, we've got a, a final question that we had prepared for you. So uh, why don't we hear that one final question, and then we'll move to uh, to one more after that. So a lot of people are looking for additional resources to set up and plan an escape room. Are there templates available for certain types of escape rooms? Janine, we'll pitch that one over to you. Templates. So um, I actually had a, a several of them that I shared at the Sun Conference, um, and they're just simple templates that you could actually go from one step to another. And we actually had the ebook that um, that you actually prepared um, the Laredell site, which is a great resource as well. But um, just really keeping it in line and going from one step to another. There's several of them that are out there, and they can reach out to me too, and I can be happy to share those as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Jim. Templates. Um, I actually have to bow to Janine uh, because she was she actually put on the very first escape room that I saw, and I actually used the uh, the resources that she had, um, and I think the uh, the one that that Laird all put out um, really summarizes best and gives you a really good map for 
creating, uh, you know, walking through those steps to get to that creation. Um, so I have to give my kudos to Janine. Great, thank you. And Brian? Um, lot, web search. Cer there's, a, there's a lot of stuff available. Um, along with Laird, all, like I said, put out a lot of information, but there's a lot of other information. Um, attend conferences. Um, this is a hot topic at conferences right now. And there's, uh, I, I was at IMSH and I, I did two, two sessions uh, related to, I didn't do them, I attended them um, at IMSH. Um, got many great ideas uh, for our next room. And then the other thing I would all encourage you to do if you're thinking about doing an escape room is go to a commercial escape room in, in your area or two or three, do multiple rooms. And you'd be surprised how many of their ideas you can recreate uh, into healthcare um, scenarios. That, that's outstanding advice, just to, to get into a different element and, and see what others are doing. Um, because- If I can uh, add one more quick thing. By all means. Um, ask the folks that are around you. Um, we've, you know, have you ever done an escape room? Uh, we have one nurse that's done over 60. Um, hmm. She is my go-to person every single time when I'm, when I'm caught. But ask, tons of people have done them, so ask around you. Uh, there's many avenues you can get. Very good. So we've got, um, thank you. And um, uh, we're, we're going to move on to just one last uh, question before we, uh, before we do a wrap up. Um, so here we are, we've, we've got this uh, huge audience that 90% um, of which um, has not embarked on this journey yet and, and some, some have. Um, what thoughts, inspiration, advice, uh, final words of wisdom would you leave someone who's just starting on this journey, just, just beginning out? And we're, we're going to begin with you, Janine, please. So, so what I would say was just take the risk and, and do it. Um, it's a team building experience actually to create your own escape room. Um, and we had so much fun building ours. But not only that, when you see the results of your escape room and you see the fun and learning and how they associate things, um, it's the benefit is just amazing. So I would just say just jump in, do it, and, um, and take the risk. Go for it. Great. Thank you. Jim? I completely agree. Um, have fun with this. Um, the, I, I think the key for me when creating them is just getting that flow down, making sure um, that you've got fun opportunities that lead to, to other things, um, but make it fun. Um, be creative, you know, look around at the things that you have and hey, how can I make that into some sort of clue? Um, you know, I've got a low fidelity baby. Let's put something in the diaper. Um, so <laughs> along those lines, just look around you at what you have and you'd be surprised at how much you can create from those simple things. Sure. Brian, weigh in please. Jim's last sentence, use simple things. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. Don't make your puzzles too difficult. Uh, bring, <laughs> excuse me, um, keep them so simple that someone can come in and solve it. It, it doesn't need to be, uh, you're not trying to trick them uh, or trying to make it that they're not successful. Um, obviously, you can't leave all the answers laying out, but those people are coming in blind, uh, other than maybe a topic of what they should know. Um, they have no idea what kind of puzzles you put in place for them. So, um, so keep them solvable um, and, uh, and keep them somewhat available so, uh, so they're successful. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, um, with those last comments, um, first we'd like to thank the audience who has uh, dialed in for this. We hope that, uh, we hope that you've, you've um, gained some value through it and uh, we just wanna say thank you um, from Lairdall to all of you for allowing us to be a part of the pursuit of your healthcare um, training and uh, growth goals. For our panelists today, Janine, Jim, 
Brian, thank you all very much for joining us and investing your time. And um, we're, we're humbled by your comments about our recent uh, e-book. Um, and, and to that end, I'd like to, to just make sure that our audience uh, knows that they can find more uh, resources on designing and running a simulation escape room at lairdahl.com forward slash sim escape room. So we'd like to bid everyone a uh, wonderful afternoon, a wonderful uh, weekend coming up, and thank you very much for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.